Okay, and we're back. Um, oh, I thought this was an appropriate comic since uh, I don't know if it's any, anybody's been following the stock market, but uh, yes, it is uh, not looking so good. Nor is the Canadian dollar for those of you who do cross border shopping. Um, all right, so what is the source of radiation? If there's anything that you take out of this course, it's that we need to know what the source of radiation is. So when we derived the wave equation, Initially, you said, okay, this is uh, not in material or anything like that. Um, and so we ended up with this left-hand side where we had the second order derivative of the electric field and the magnetic field in uh, space and the second order derivative of the field in time, and that equaled zero. And that is uh, the wave equation. And so we knew that these electromagnetic uh, waves existed, uh, but then if we actually kept the... Uh, the source terms, the uh, rho over epsilon naught and the mu naught times uh, j, uh, the current density, then we would actually come up with that this is an inhomogeneous wave equation where we have the permeability of free space times rho, which is the charge density, times the second derivative of this, po of this position of this charge density. So an inhomogeneous wave equation, uh, we put the homogeneous part on the left-hand side, and we put uh, this inhomogeneous part on the right-hand side, and this gives us our inhomogeneous wave equation, and we found that an inhomogeneous wave equation, this stuff that's on the right-hand side, is going to be a source term. It's, it's a source term, it's an energy, it's basically a source of an energy that's feeding into this, this left-hand side. And so this right-hand side here is the source, or this, this uh, accelerating charge density is the source for these electromagnetic waves, and then these electromagnetic waves propagate. So we already knew that an, uh, uh, an accelerating electric charge was the source for electromagnetic waves, okay? Then, when we also derived the radiating field from a dipole, uh, we found that the electric field went as one over R, um, and we discarded the terms that went over one over R squared, um, and things like that because we knew that we wanted the pointing vector to go as 1 over r squared. And so it turned out that if we looked at the radiation emitted by a dipole, um, that we could get this one term that remains that goes as 1 over r. And so, um, but the, tor the term that went as 1 over r came from this accelerating term in this electric field, in this generalized electric field. And so in two different instances, we've shown that electromagnetic radiation comes from an accelerating charge, okay? So that's the one thing that I want you to take out from this class is that an accelerating charge emits radiation. So just make sure you know that <laughs> um, because you should really know that um, as somebody who's uh, working in, uh, you know, in physics and soon to be graduating with an undergraduate degree in physics. You should really, really know that. It's really important, okay? So if you forget everything else in this course, I'm fine with that. You can forget everything about special relativity. You can forget everything about pointing vectors and stuff like that. But remember that radiation comes from an accelerating charge or an accelerating charge releases radiation, all right? So it's very, very important. Okay, but what does that mean? Right? So let's look at what happens if we have uh, an accelerating charge. So um, Rutherford, um, and he had two people working for him, um, Geiger and Marsden, um, came up with an experiment where they had this really, really thin piece of gold and they bombarded it with alpha particles, which are just uh, helium nuclei. And they didn't, uh, they very rarely scattered um, from the gold. Um, foil, and so that showed that basically even though this was opaque gold, most of that material is actually uh, transparent to these um, alpha particles, these little charred billiard balls. And so basically what they deduced was that instead of an atom being composed of some solid uh, blob, that it was actually uh, mostly made up of nothing, and the way that the alpha particle deflected implied that the nucleus was also uh, positively charged, just like the alpha particle. 
Um, but the gold foil is obviously neutral, and so there's some like loose sea of electrons that float around, um, and that's, these gold particles um, are relatively stationary, or these uh, charge, positively charged particles are relatively stationary. Um, and so people were kind of trying to figure out what was going on with this, and then Bohr came up with this planetary model where we have an electron um, that orbits around uh, this positively charged nucleus. And so for a hydrogen atom, we just have a single electron that orbits around a single proton. Um, and what he said was that uh, in, this, in this model, we can have this quantization of uh, this angular momentum where he said that it's um, proportional to h-bar. Uh, where h bar is Planck's constant because Planck's constant actually already has units of angular momentum. Uh, I have notes that I will be uploading as well um, that get into a little bit more detail about this. But needless to say, as this electron is spinning around um, in this orbit, that it should be radiating um, an electromagnetic wave, right? It's an accelerating charge, as we just said, an accelerating charge emits radiation, and so. Um, if it's emitting radiation, then that means it's some power um, associated with that. So this thing is going around at some velocity, and it turns out that actually for an electron orbiting around uh, a proton, it takes 152 attoseconds, and that's kind of the timescales of the work that I do. So just a little bit of a you know mention about the stuff that I'm interested in. Um, is this this happens on a very very fast time scale, so like on the order of a billionth of a billionth of a second this electron flies around this proton in this model. Um, but the, the problem with this though, as I'm saying, is that this electric charge would be radiating. Um, so if we actually calculate if uh, how long this would take to, uh, to radiate away all of its energy, um, we looked at, at the energy of, um, uh, of, a, of an orbit would be uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q squared over 2 r naught or 13.6 eV. In fact, this should probably be negative because it's a bound electron, um, arguably, um, because it takes 13.6 electron volts to actually ionize uh, this electron or half a heart tree, if, for those of you who work in atomic units. Um, but anyways, this electron has so much energy as it's in this stable orbit. And now we're going to say, OK, instead of this being a stable orbit, this is actually radiating away energy. Um, and so, as I said, I have more detailed um, notes about this and handwritten notes that I'll upload. But this uh, this power is then uh, dissipates, and that that this electron loses energy, so this orbit goes in a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, and it turns out that even though this orbit takes about 150 attoseconds, that then that means that this orbit is actually only stable for about 16 picoseconds. So 150 attoseconds would be 150 times 10 to the negative 18 seconds, uh, and 16 picoseconds is 16 times 10 to the negative 12 seconds. And so uh, that means that we're looking at, it's at five orders of magnitude um, difference between this oscillation. So this thing oscillates a whole bunch of times in the time that it decays, but it only takes about 16 picoseconds. So if quantum mechanics didn't work, if things actually did follow the Bohr atom and classical physics, then uh, we very quickly recognize that there's something wrong going on here um, because all matter should uh, collapse in it on itself and um, that would end the universe as we know it. So obviously that's not correct because we're around. The universe has been around for quite a while. Um, and so uh, that led to the advent of quantum mechanics, which is not what this course is talking about. But um, these were some of the problems that they had in classical mechanics that they were trying to resolve um, because um, electricity and magnetism turned, turned to be a very, very robust theory, um, but there were obviously limitations to it. And so that required some further understanding of what was going on. But we already knew that th this is going to be wrong because when we did um, uh, radiation from an electric dipole, we already knew that some of, that we made a bunch of approximations that actually don't work very well at this really small uh, scale. So it turns out that R0 is about half an angstrom, um, or about 5 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. So it's really, really small. Um, and we already knew that uh, we couldn't look at how this stuff worked 
at scales that were much smaller than the wavelength of the light, um, where the wavelength of this would be something like 100 nanometers. And so um, we're looking at something that's on the order of 0 0.01 nanometers, I guess 0 0.05 nanometers, um, but the wavelength of light that it would be emitting would be on the order of 100 nanometers. So already our, our this is this model is already breaking down. So we know this is wrong already. Um, okay, so we already know that something funny is happening here, uh, but I want to look at other consequences, and that is the radiation reaction. So the radiation reaction, um, we uh, is uses the consequence of the Larmor formula. So we derived the Larmor formula in class. We had an electric uh, dipole that was oscillating. Um, and when we had a dipole oscillating, this we get the exact same formula here that we get uh, the power radiated is proportional to uh, A squared, um, but we had a factor of 12 here instead of factor of 6, so we're off by factor of 2. But that's because it was an oscillating dipole, and so an oscillating dipole we have to integrate over the cycle average of cosine squared, and so that gives us a half. So for an arbitrary charge, um, the power dissipated is still dependent on the accelerating uh, charge squared, or the acceleration, uh, acceleration squared, um, but it's over a factor of 6 pi instead of 12 pi. Okay, but the weird thing comes about when you now put this charge in an electric field. So say you have this charge and you want to accelerate it. So say you have um, a free electron laser or a synchrotron or you know some other reason that you're accelerating this charge. You put it in this electric field and it accelerates. Right, that makes sense. But what we've just been talking about is how a charged particle that's accelerating will produce electromagnetic waves, right? And we've said that there's a power associated with these electromagnetic waves. And so what's going on is that this charge is actually going to, um, this, this radiation is actually going to dissipate some of that energy. Um, and that's going to, that energy is going to dissipate at some rate, which means that we have some power. Uh, so that means that we put a charged particle in, we've applied a force through this field and it's accelerating away but it's actually resisting this acceleration because it's um, also radiating. Um, and so um, if you th think about this in terms of Newtonian mechanics, something that slows down um, relative to a force would be like a, it would be like a drag. So say you have like a, a block on a table and you're pushing it along to accelerate it, but it's something slowing it down, that's equivalent to a, a, a drag. Um, or a friction. And so that means that this friction can be also a force. Um, and so this leads us to the Abraham Lorentz formula uh, that he derives in the textbook. Um, and it takes a very similar form to uh, this Abraham Lorentz formula here. Um, it's a force, but it takes a very similar form to the power radiated. Um, so basically, instead of being dependent on uh, the acceleration squared, it's dependent on actually the rate of change of the acceleration. Um, and the rate of change of the acceleration is actually called a jerk. Um, um, and so this is this is kind of the amount of drag that this uh, thing has. Um, so I want to look at a consequence of that is if we have a, a charged particle um, that's oscillating up and down, so say we had a mass um, that's kind of on a spring and there's some damping term. So we already know this from mechanics. And so if we have uh, this mass of this charge times its acceleration is going to be proportional, or it's going to be equal to this force of a spring and some damping term where the force of the spring, of course, is negative kx, where k is the spring constant. <clears throat> Um, we've just been talking about this damping term, and so we're going to use this Abraham Lorentz formula as our damping term. And so it turns out for an electron, this damping term is going to be the mass of the electron times this tau, um, which is some characteristic lifetime uh, of the electron. So we have the permeability of free space with the charge of the electron over 6 pi times m. Uh, m is going to be the mass of the electron times c the speed of light. Um, so this will be char some characteristic of the electron. And we can now put this into our second order, or it's actually a th third order differential equation, where uh, the second order derivative with respect to space um, minus this third order derivative um, with respect to space um, 
plus this characteristic frequency squared times its position is equal to zero. And this looks like the um, damped harmonic oscillator, um, but instead of this being proportional to the velocity, it's actually proportional to the jerk. Um, but if we recognize that this thing is going to be oscillating a whole bunch of times uh, before it actually damps out like an underdamped system, then we can approximate that this third order derivative um, with respect to space is going to be proportional to the second or to the first order derivative with respect to space and the first order derivative with respect to space is velocity. And so then we can change this easily into our normal um, second order differential equation, which is second order derivative with respect to time, a damping factor that's proportional to velocity, and then this characteristic frequency um, that's proportional to this position is equal to zero. And we get uh, a solution that looks like this, where the position is now dependent on some amplitude and then some decaying exponential where this damping factor is determined by this uh, oscillating frequency and this characteristic time of the electron, and then times the cosine of this oscillation, uh, where omega d is basically this uh, characteristic frequency with a correction factor that's proportional to this damping factor. Um, so we can put some numbers into this, and so for visible light um, that oscillates at uh, several, uh, you know, on the order of 10 to the 15 uh, radians per second, that uh, and if we put in the, the numbers for an electron, that we get out something that's on the order of 10 megahertz, um, which is about how broad atomic line widths are. Um, so people find uh, hyperfine transitions for cesium clocks, and people have now used strontium transitions, hyperfine transitions. And so these are actually um, good to down to one hertz or so. Um, but these hyperfine transitions tend to be in the order of kilohertz. Um, and so 10 megahertz is a pretty good estimate for you know um, a lot of atomic transitions. So this actually ends up being kind of in the right ballpark. Um, obviously, in order to actually understand this, we need quantum mechanics um, to explain atomic lifetimes um, and to give us properly the d decay rate of uh, you know state transitions. But this kind of gives an gives us an idea of uh, why when we have say you know. Uh, some charged, uh, like when we have like an, an electron in an excited state um, and it's orbiting around um, why the lifetime of this uh, atom in this excited state, you know, lasts for on the order of nanoseconds. Um, and that's because that's, that's caused by, classically that's caused by this damping, this damping term here. And this damping term is a characteristic of the electron. Okay. So, um, so now we can talk about the uh, mechanism of radiation reaction. Um, and basically, he approaches the same problem, but he looks at it from a different way. Uh, that um, if you look at Newton Newton's laws um, in um, um, when we yeah when we looked at Newton's laws with retarded potentials that we found that um, uh, that there that there is this um, that Newton's third law where the you know for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction it turns out that it starts to break down with uh, ret with uh, retarded potentials um, and that's because the signal from one particle um, or the, the yeah the field from one particle hasn't reached the other particle necessarily in the same way um, and so that starts to cause uh, um, like an inconsistency, I guess, in um, in these potentials. And if you carefully go through it, as he does in the textbook, you end up with the exact same uh, condition. Um, he does make some caveats. He sets it up in a very specific way that you have this charge that's separated, you know, into two halves in a dumbbell shape, and it's um, going along, um, you know, in a direction that's orthogonal to the, the direction of the dumbbell um, because it depends on your orientation of the dumbbell. You can have a sphere, which is how Lorentz did it, but the math is, is nasty. Um, so basically this is kind of like a, a very uh, ju judiciously chosen configuration so that this, um, so that the numbers work out exactly the same way. Um, but what he finds is that um, you can, 
you can get some physical insight into this, and that is that as you are accelerating this charge, um, it actually starts to uh, change the mass. Instead of having a drag, it actually is that the mass of the particle um, is changing um, due to the fields. And so uh, basically that leads us to the, um, uh, the uh, energy uh, mass equivalency that Einstein develops as a subject of special relativity. Um, so it's kind of like an interesting uh, take on it that instead of it being a drag like what you have with, with Newton's laws, what you get is instead that this field starts to contribute energy, um, but this accelerating charge starts to contribute energy into the field and that ends up actually increasing its mass, which ends up resisting this acceleration. Um, and it ends up turning out to be the exact same form. Um, and so it's two different ways of looking at the same thing. Um, and that idea of looking at those uh, two different problems looking at the same way will lead us to uh, relativity. Um, and that will be the subject of the next video. Thank you.